I was approached by the Stasi. I was visited by a woman and each time, you know, I was more and more certain that, you know, she was making some kind of approach and she did eventually start asking me for information about political views of other other Western students. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who's our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Bryan Hartley of Thornton the Field, asking what's being done to build up anglo soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 32 of Cold War Conversations. Today we speak with Eileen Ford Price, who is a British student in the GDR in the 1980s in Rostock. Before we start, I'd like to thank all our Patreons who donate monthly to support the podcast further and get access to some exclusive extras. Monthly donations can be as small as a dollar or a quid, and every donation helps to keep us broadcasting and expanding the show. Just go to our website at coldwarconversations.com and click on the support the podcast menu option. Now, back to today's episode. Eileen shares some great details with us, including her reasons for being a student in the GDR, her first journey across the border, and what life was like in 1980s Rostock as a foreign student. It's a fascinating story that includes the Stasi's attempt to recruit her as an informer on her fellow students. We welcome Eileen Ford Price. Well, I was born in Edinburgh in the early 1960s, and I, I grew up in a place called Bowness, which is fairly close to Edinburgh. And and really, you know, before I went to the GDR, I'd only been out of Scotland a couple of times. So it was, you know, it was something quite big for me to do. It was something quite exciting and a, a bit of an adventure for me. And and what what did you what did your parents do? What what were their jobs? Okay, so um, as I mentioned that I I grew up in a place called Bowness, which you know it's a fairly industrial town, and um, my father was uh, an iron molder in a local foundry. So there's two two foundries in Bowness. My dad worked as an iron molder in one of them, and my mum was a typist in the other one. So right. That, that's my background. So, you know, quite an ordinary working class background. Yeah, I'm, because I'm, I'm intrigued because, I mean, going to study in the GDR or behind the Iron Curtain as it was then wouldn't seem to be a, an obvious choice. Uh, no. So, so the way that it came about was, um, so I studied languages, um, French and German at Edinburgh University. And th- there was... Edinburgh University's German department had an exchange program with uh, Rostock and uh, Leipzig in the GDR. And and when I say an exchange program, that was students from Edinburgh could go and study for a year in in Rostock or Leipzig. Um, But lecturers from those universities uh, had the opportunity to visit Edinburgh. Um, So, you know, it wasn't a sort of like for like exchange program the, the you know the, the opportunity presented itself to to go and study in in east germany yeah no fantastic and before you went were you sort of warned how to behave or what not to do or anything like that not really you know we just went out there uh, i mean obviously before we were allowed to go we would have been vetted i'm sure you know, so, so you know, I don't think we would have been allowed to study there if we'd been undesirables or members of political... Well, so, you know, like young conservatives or something parties. like that, you might not have... Uh... I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah. Possibly not. Okay. Possibly not. And you didn't have to fill out a questionnaire or anything or... 
No, 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 no. But I say I'm I'm fairly sure that we, you know, we would have been vetted in some way. How did you prepare to to go there? Because did you know that you were going to be out there for for two years, and presumably you knew you were going to come back during that period as well? Yes. Um, so um, it, it was it was for initially I was just going out for one term. So I I was just going from September and then you know, after Christmas, I would go to a university in, you know, either West Germany or, or Austria or somewhere like that. So it, it, that, that that was the initial plan. And then, you know, I decided partway through that term in, in, in Rostock that, um, you know, I wanted to stay for the full year. Um, so, you know, that was my, my year's study in, in East Germany. How How did you get out there? Coach from Edinburgh down to London, the train to um, Harwich, overnight ferry from Harwich to Hook of Holland, train through you know Holland and West Germany yeah. to Rostock. Yeah, so you know it was a good long journey, and that was it. You know, every time I went there was you know going back and forward was you know pretty much a twenty four yeah. hour journey. Yeah. What was the <laughs> the crossing of the the inner German border? like it was actually quite terrifying um you know bearing in mind that i was uh 19 years old at the mm -hmm. time and, and and i was traveling with one other girl and and you know she was the same age as me and you know neither of us had ever experienced anything like this before so the the, the train stopped and was stationary for about an hour while it was searched by border guards with um, with dogs, with sniffer dogs, and it, you know it was searched really thoroughly. Um, we were questioned fairly thoroughly on where we were going and why we were going there. You know, so which you know you, you can imagine sort of two teenage girls going abroad. Um, experiencing this for the first time, I found it pretty yeah, scary. Yeah, no, I can imagine. But of course, you know, I did that border crossing many times as it happened, you know, and you, I suppose it's, it's a little bit like boiled frog syndrome. You you kind of, you get used to it, you know. So, you know, after a few times crossing, it was just, okay, here we are at the border. We stop for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and we wait. And, um, you know, that's just how it is. And they they searched your uh, baggage and everything, did they? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes. Um, I mean, I would I imagine it was probably West Germans that were travelling that were more of a target for for being searched. But you know, you you certainly you would you know you might have your hand luggage searched or um, you know you would be questioned fairly thoroughly about you know what you were up to. Could you remember what you made of Rostock when you first arrived? What what you thought of it? Yeah, so the, those uh, those first few days. Um, so so the, the there was quite a lot of international students. There wasn't just myself and and the other student from Edinburgh. There was there were there were quite a few of us. So there were there were also students from uh, Bradford University um and and you know other other universities in in France and the United States there was a, a Norwegian student as well um and also some Bulgarian students and we were all there before the term started for the East German students so we had you know a, a few days to acclimatize but really before the um the East German students started and it felt in in that time, it felt a little bit like going back in time. It felt as if Rostock possibly, or, or certainly, or that area hadn't changed very much since, like maybe the nineteen thirties. Um, you know, just just in the way it felt. I mean, I I can remember walking down the street, and I saw um, a chimney sweep, and it was a, a chimney sweep. He was you know all dressed in traditional kind of chimney sweep black clothing with a black top hat and up on a roof and it, you know so it, it felt like seeing something from you know 30 40 years before or even 50 years ago so that you know it was and, and a lot of it felt like that you know a lot of the buildings you could imagine that they hadn't really 
changed very much for you know a number of years and, and one of the things that of course that sort of stands and uh, every, you know when visitors from the west at that time went to the east people would often say oh it's really kind of gray and and drab and there's not very much color and to a certain extent that was true but you sort of realize that part of that is that you're not seeing like advertising hoardings all over the place uh you know you're not seeing loads of like you know you know neon lights flashing you know the adverts for the latest toothpaste or the latest uh, l'oreal shampoo you know so so some of it was because of that i think you know that 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 impression that you got of the kind of grayness came from from that yeah to, no to i understand extent. understand what, what what you're saying there and what was it like being a british student there presumably the the east german students were quite interested in hearing your views or 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 not can you just describe what what you know what your experiences were like um, yeah, I, I, I'd say that's absolutely right, that people were interested in, in hearing our views. From the point of view, I mean, from, certainly from our, our lecturers and, and sort of people in positions of authority, my impression was that the, the British and American students tended to be treated with a little bit more suspicion than the other students, you know, the the the, the French and the, the Norwegians and and the Bulgarians, but yeah, in in, in general, there, there was you know definitely an interest in us. There was a little bit I found sort of almost like pressure to take part in activities, um, to sort of be so, be sociable and be be uh, you know to get involved with things. Um, and, and what sort of activities were you? convinced to uh, participate in well <laughs> well um, to be honest not particularly convinced but you know what i mean one of my lecturers had you know cottoned on to the fact that i played a little bit of guitar very badly but he didn't know that but he was desperate for me to play with this folk band and and this was absolutely you know my worst nightmare really performing publicly <laughs> and you know i think there, there was i mean that may sound kind of quite trivial but there was certainly that general kind of social pressure to sort of, you know, to, to be involved, to take part in things, you know, and it wasn't just, you know, to sort of take part in like political activities, um, but also to, you know, sort of be, you know, a, a good member of society and, you know, be creative and be, you know, to, to like I say, do things like performing in a folk band. And were you asked to participate in political activities as well? Uh, no, 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 absolutely not. Um, I think that that was reserved for the the East German students, um, and I think I say I mentioned that the you know so the British and the Americans were treated with a certain amount of suspicion. I don't think our presence would have been particularly welcomed at any political activities. It, you know, it may it may have been felt that the influence of those sort of outside ideas you know wouldn't have gone down particularly well and what what about things like food and clothes and just regular stuff that you need day to day how how did you get access to that did you have to use the regular local shops or were you on a campus and relatively insulated we lived in student halls um so there was like two high-rise buildings um, next door to each other in Erich Schlesinger Straße. And the buildings are still there. I, I, I've had a look recently on, on Google Maps. The buildings are actually still there. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know whether there's still student accommodation or not, but we, so each of the international students shared a room with an East German student. Um, or, yeah, yeah. So, so we, you know, we, we had a somebody who... <clears throat> looked after us and mentored us and and they were east germans you know so we so we were kind of like you know fed in, in with different people food uh was incredibly cheap really really cheap um so and 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 things like travel was was ridiculously cheap so so we had a a monthly 
student grant. So our, our our student grant from Edinburgh was paid for that year was paid to Rostock, and we got a monthly student grant from Rostock University, um, which obviously, given the exchange rate, was a lot less than our grant from Edinburgh. But in terms of living in East Germany, it was still a huge amount of money. You know, I'd never had that much disposable income when I lived in Edinburgh. <laughs> you know, so and and so it was three hundred marks per month, and uh, rent for the student accommodation was ten marks per month. So that left two hundred and ninety marks per month to spend. You know, and bearing in mind that a you know a loaf of bread cost you about fifty pfennig, you can imagine that there was a massive amount of money to spend the difficulty was actually spending it you know way more money than than i could actually spend i didn't buy clothes yeah i mean i i I didn't go clothes shopping whether that was because there wasn't that much to buy by way of clothes um i don't know i mean this was i mean another interesting thing was i mean the way that i dressed was sort of I mean, I wasn't exactly a punk, but, you know, it was sort of verging on, you know, slightly punky. That definitely stood out in a place like Rostock. You know, people definitely noticed that you were a little bit different and, and you know, you weren't, you certainly weren't East German. There were occasions when people would actually come up to me in the street and criticise what I was wearing. <laughs> like complete, stra- complete strangers, Yeah. <laughs> Or make really, really foul comments. <laughs> um, you know, so, and I say it wasn't, you know, what I, the way I dressed wasn't particularly outrageous. Um, you know, nobody would like blink an eye in, in Edinburgh, um, but certainly in, in Rostock. And East Germany being a society of conformity, anybody who didn't conform to the um, sort of recognised standard, I suppose... Um, would would have stood out like that so the the person that you shared the room with what did they give you any advice or did they you know well i'm i'm intrigued because i i would think that they are a a trusted person to share the room with a westerner yeah yes um this that's quite a difficult one because um she was on the face of it, fairly critical and, and you know, and, and also fairly open to ideas and, and discussion and, and you know, different points of view. But I did find out later when I got my Stasi file, I know, that, I know that's something that you did want to ask me about, that, you know, she was one of the people who was reporting back on unsurprisingly i suppose considering she's sharing a room with you but uh, well yeah i I mean it's it's one of these things where you know i i should really have i should really have realized that well beforehand but i didn't so um you know because she, she didn't seem like the sort of person that would be it sounds like nobody said that anybody would be watching you or anything like that it's easy to think of it in the retrospective of the of present day with films like the life of others and stuff like that but i think at at the time you wouldn't have necessarily um thought of that um you you was it was certainly something that you did become aware of you know people did in conversation quite often refer to the stasi and and so you you were absolutely aware that you know a huge number of people were stasi informers quite the extent to which that was the case you know wasn't apparent and obviously until the Stasi files were opened but you know you were you were definitely aware um and and I mean one of the things that strikes me was I mean people would often say oh yeah he's in Stasi or you know yeah he's probably Stasi and I'm sure that quite a few of those suspicions were unfounded it may just have been that you know somebody didn't like that person so you know the easy thing was to say oh yeah they were in the Stasi but it was that sort of there was that atmosphere of suspicion. Was that other East German students saying to you 
watch them there in the stars. Yes, 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 it was. Yeah. And what were your fellow students like? It sounds like you might have had a mix of hardcore party loyalists like your roommate, let's say, and others who didn't have a lot of time for the regime? Yes, I, I mean, it, it was a mixture. I mean, I, I I did know one or two people who, you know, whose, whose right to study was revoked because they were too critical. Um, that, that, that did happen. And, you know, it was, I mean, it was a huge mixture of people. I mean, a lot of people who were from the local area, one or two people from Berlin. I mean, one of the, the, the things that I found quite interesting about the East German students is that they they all went home at the weekend. You know, they all they all went, you know, if they lived in Berlin or if they lived on the North Coast, they all they all travelled home back to their parents um, at the weekend. So we were all kind of left, you know, all the international students, we were left to our own devices for the for the weekend in sort of two great big empty student houses. Wow. And and did you ever visit anybody in their homes or anything like that? Uh, yes, I went to my roommate's home, um, which I've I, I got to say, you know, cause no, knowing that I was going to be talking to you, I, I, I dug out some of my photos and, um, you know, I, I found photographs of the two of us, you know, visiting her, her parents, and um, uh, which I'd, I'd, I'd completely forgotten about. Um, but yeah, yeah, and and um, I mean that was in general. I'd say people were really, really friendly, and you know there were lots of invitations to people's homes, you know, for for, for meals, um, for socialising, um, you know, even the occasional breakfast invitation. So so you know that the, there was you know a lot of the 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 leisure time would 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 be in people's homes. But and obviously visiting. Visiting people's homes appears to be a, a significant chunk of that. Was there there anything else you did? Did you go and see concerts or? So uh, I mean, eating out was was a big thing. As I mentioned that you know I had a, a, a lot of income, you know, a lot of disposable income, and you know, so you know, as 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 a foreign student, you could eat out every day of the week. <laughs> um, so, and and this is, I mean, one of the things that people don't realise is that you know there was there was some you know really good food to be had in east germany i mean there were some some great restaurants i mean there was there was my favorite restaurant in in rostock was the um the Drushba, um or or freundschaft uh, friendship restaurant um which was in the russian barracks and it was run by the officers wives um, you know, so it was a it was a proper Russian restaurant, and you know it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, the the, the food was amazing. You know, and, and I say in general, there was you know some some you know really nice food to be had in restaurants. Cinema visits, you know, so so quite often went to the cinema. One one of the the the, the most memorable um, cinema visits. So actually, I saw it twice, but it was you know the film uh, Metropolis. Um, the you know nine, um, so I saw it in the cinema in Rostock, but accompanied by live piano, um, which was I mean it was it was amazing, um, and um, you know it was really good. Um, but the the one of the things about going to the cinema, so you know you, you'd go along to see you know whatever the the, the latest film was, um, the latest feature film, but there was always a short film beforehand and it would be something you know some sort of um something where that would teach you about um the great socialist project so i mean the one that sticks in my mind is um the uh the the paprika harvest in hungary you know, sort of teaching you about how, you know, how brilliant the harvest was and, you know, how successful it was and how hard people worked. And, you know, it was all about, you know, sort of, it was a bit pedagogical. Yeah, it doesn't really sound like Pearl and Dean. <laughs> no, exactly. It was different, though. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And, um, 
I mean, one and one of the other things that we'd get up to. Um, so Monday evenings, as I mentioned, the the, the student buildings mm-hmm. in 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 Erich So on the top floor of the building that I lived in, there was a bar which opened up on Monday evenings for English evenings, and that was um, only English was spoken. And so the 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 British and the American students would. Um, you know, talk about some aspect mm-hmm. of British or American life. And, you know, it would, it would take different formats. You know, sometimes it was a question and answer thing. Sometimes people would give talks. Um, and there was one time where we did a, a punk evening Bet and that went down well. invited people to dress up as punks. <laughs> and it was, it was great. It was brilliant. <laughs> I, and I, I've, been trying to find the photographs i can't find them um because um we moved house recently and i i, I just i don't know where they are but you know there's photographs Brilliant. of you know of all these east german students dressed up that sounds punks. great what 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 did your <laughs> um your your teachers say about the west um it it, it depended largely uh, really on whether they'd actually been or not so you know, there was there was some of our lecturers mm-hmm. who had never been to the West, and who you know had a fairly um, stereotypical idea of of the West. Um, you know that everybody was starving, and that you know it was uh, you know people were struggling to pay for their their homes and that sort of thing. But you know. I guess it's not so different from some of the stereotypes that Western people had of life in the East, you know, yeah. that, that, you know, it is much more nuanced, but, you know, both, both sides are much more nuanced really. But, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, there was, you know, one lecturer whose, whose house I was invited to who had John Lennon posters on the wall, you know, and, and I mean, John, John Lennon was seen as a, mm you know, a, 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 a bit of a subversive figure, you know, so, so, so for, you know, for somebody to have posters of him on the wall was, was an indication that they, you know, they, they weren't completely, you know, brainwashed by a, you know, one ideology. So, you know, there was, I say it was, it varied, you know, some, you know, some, you know, some people were fairly open. Other people had these, these stereotyped ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And how much were you sort of fed propaganda? I mean, you mentioned the uh, exciting footage of the Hungarian paprika yeah, yeah. harvest. Well, something that's stuck in my mind. So it was <laughs> no, no. It was exciting. <laughs> no, no. Um, but were, were there any other, you know, situations where the, you know, the, the propaganda was, you know, pushed at you? Um. I mean, we we did have to um, attend lectures in Marxism Leninism, which was um, oh yeah, tell, exciting. Tell me, <laughs> tell me more about that. Well, I have a huge confession to make, which is I really can't remember that much about it. So, which which is an indication that they weren't that exciting, really. Um, but and and also, you know, GDR history was was obviously from a, a socialist point of view. But yeah. I, I mean. You know, obviously, the, the 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 you know propaganda was everywhere. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it, I think, was empty sloganeering. So, I mean, I had I had one discussion with um, some students who oh, about apartheid in South Africa, mm-hmm. and they knew that from you know what they'd heard that apartheid was a bad thing. Because that that's what they'd be told, but they didn't actually know what apartheid was. So you know, I found myself having to explain to them what it actually meant, and and you know, I think that there were a few instances like that where, it, you know, nobody had bothered to kind of dig deeper underneath the slogans um, to actually understand what what they meant. Yeah, it's just sloganeering and no context behind it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, we we talked a little bit about students, you know, warning you that somebody was Stasi. 
how much were you aware of? Were you aware of the Stasi at all, or, or were you ever questioned by by anybody? I'm just thinking because you were looking a bit different to everybody else. Were you stopped and questioned by police mm. or or anything like that while you were out? I've I've got a story about the police actually, which I, w- I will I will tell you later. Don't don't let me forget. But um, uh, I mean, I was approached by the Stasi. Um, I was visited by a woman in my student halls, and she knew exactly who I was, and she knew stuff about me that I had no idea how she knew you know how she got this information um and but you know she 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 had come on on the pretext of being a friend and and you know sort of becoming friends and you know there were some of the things that she was saying to me that just made me very suspicious so for example she was telling me about all the problems she was having with her boyfriend and um that she wasn't allowed to see her boyfriend anymore because her father was in the stasi um, and her boyfriend was a foreigner, so she wasn't allowed to have contact with foreigners. And, you know, as she's telling me this, I'm I'm scratching my head and thinking, well, why are you actively looking for me? You know, I didn't invite you. You came here of your own accord. And, you mm. know, it, obviously the alarm bells were ringing. And I had several visits from her. And each time, you know, I was more and more certain that, you know, she was making some kind of approach. And she did eventually start asking me for information about political views of other other Western students, uh, you know, which I, I wasn't prepared to discuss with, with somebody that I barely knew. So, Yeah, so she was making an approach for you to be a informer. I'm fairly sure that she was, yeah. And, and, and I mean, other other Western students had similar approaches so you know it, it it definitely happened so yeah so you were only going to be there for mm. a term and then you stayed for i think two years well, I, overall, I stayed for it? a whole year in rostock um and then went mm-hmm. back to uh, so in may june 1984 i went back to edinburgh and finished my studies there so i had one more year to to study at edinburgh and then when I'd finished yeah. my studies, I applied to be a lecturer at um, in Berlin, the Humboldt mm-hmm. University. So, so it was sort of two years, but with a gap in, in the middle. So why did you decide to, to go back? I think the sense of adventure, really, you know, and, and you know, wanting to find out more. I mean, I, I think, you know, bearing in mind, you know, that sort of the, the, the context was that I was somebody who could go backwards and forwards as I wanted to, you know, I wasn't, I, I, mm. I wasn't committed to staying there for the rest of my life, you know? So I said, just that, that, you know, sense of adventure, sense of travel, you know, wanting to travel. You know, you, you, you mentioned your fellow students. I mean, did you make any sort of close friends while uh, you yes, were there? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I'm still, still in touch with one person that, um, you know, I was friends with in Rostock. I kept, there was a, a friend, I, I mean, a, a guy I kept in touch with for many years, who was a, a lecturer in Rostock. He was he was British. Um, he was from Staffordshire, mm-hmm. and he had gone to live in the GDR in 1961. Um, married and had two children, um, and so you know he he was a very he was a lecturer. He he taught English at Rostock University, and and he was you know a very close friend. I got. Christmas, a Christmas card from him every year, um, you know, and I'd usually phone him during the Christmas holidays, you know, and this, I mean, really until last year. So that last year, you know, I didn't, I didn't get my Christmas card. And when I phoned up, the phone line was dead and I'd found out that, you know, he'd passed away um, in the August. But, you know, we, we kept in touch for, for many years. And, um, you know, I mean, he was a re- really interesting guy. You know, I say somebody who'd gone out in 1961. Um, and stayed <laughs> yeah and presumably had gone out there because he believed in the absolutely project. yeah absolutely yeah and you know talking to him after reunification there was definitely a sense of disappointment i think i mean there was one of one of his fellow lecturers um an east german woman who had been 
it, you know, when all the Stasi files were opened, it had turned out that she was a Stasi agent. But I mean, not only that, was also working for the West German secret services. So, you know, I think that sort of thing was was came as a massive disappointment to him. You know, so I think you know, in some ways, he was he he was quite sad, really, that things had come to an end in that way. But he he was a fir- yeah, so he was a firm believer in real and existing socialism. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, with with criticisms, you know, like um, like myself. <laughs> I mean, my, my my experience of most people that I met in East Germany was that you know they they really did want it to work, um, but they wanted it to to be improved. Um, you know, yeah. and and the, the you know the 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 lack of free speech and the lack of travel and travel rights um, were the two mm. big things that you know, really, really hacked people off. Um, but, you know, in general, you know, people could see the upside, you know, and, and you know, there were a lot of upsides, you know, as I mentioned that the cheap food, the cheap travel, you know, there wasn't, to my knowledge, um, homelessness in the way that, you know, we experience it in the West or, you know, people are experiencing it now. Um, no, they, they, your lecturer sounds like a... Um a fascinating um yeah character and particularly talking to him after you know the the reunification as well so he stayed he stayed in rostock he did he? Yeah. yeah yeah right okay okay well if you enjoyed eileen's story i'm delighted to say there is more a second episode will be coming soon where we hear about Eileen's return to the GDR as an English teacher in East Berlin and the time she escaped from the Vopos, not to be missed. There's photos that Eileen shared with me of her time in the GDR in the show notes, as well as links to online video too. The show notes are available at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 32. Don't forget, if you want more GDR podcast listening, GDR Radio is available soon via your podcast provider, hosted by Anka Holst, our guest in episode 20, Life as a GDR Teenager, and Shane Whaley, the host of the Spybury podcast from episode 4. I can't wait. If you like what you're listening to, do join our Facebook discussion group where there's loads of extra Cold War information and further discussions with our guests. Just search Cold War Conversations. And we're also on Twitter at Cold War Pod. Lastly, if you like what you are hearing, do leave reviews with your podcast provider. It really helps spread the word. Thank you very much for listening and supporting the podcast. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. 